Hello, a Euro special. I thought it was worth it because things are still spinning well out of control in the Eurozone. And if there is a danger to the world, it is the Eurozone spinning out of control. So this might be a bit long, but it's a very big and horrible problem. So I'm going to try and explain it all and to where we're at as best I can, I think in 11 slides. So let's start with this one, which is on the European Central Bank's website. And it sh takes us right back to the beginning. Excessive debt procedure. This is how it was set up in the beginning. The basic rule of budgetary policy enshrined in the treaty is that member states shall avoid excessive government deficits. To put the club together, they needed rules, and this was one of their main rules. Compliance with this rule is to be examined on the basis of reference values for the general government deficit, 3% per year, percentage of GDP, government deficit, 3% maximum, whereby a number of qualifications can be applied, in particular only an exceptional and temporary excess of the deficit over the reference value can be exempt from being considered excessive and then only if it remains close to the reference value. In other words, we might just let you go through if there are exceptional circumstances and it's going to just go through and it's just going to be temporary. So as long as they had the 3% deficits there and gross def debt of 60% maximum, well, you're not likely to get up on through 60% maximum well, as long as you kept your annual to only 3% deficit. Those were the rules. This is an, We're getting to up-to-date um, articles now. This was September the 1st. Dutch finance head says Germany and France bear responsibility in crisis by breaking debt rules in the past. 2003-2004, um, Jean de Quise de, Jean Quise de Jäger said that when the Eurozone's two largest economies ran deficits of more than 3% in 2003 and 2004, without penalty, it opened the floodgates for other countries to flout debt rules, ultimately leading to the current crisis. Accurately pointed out, but obviously, uh, although it's the fact, um, the others would have sneaked through anyway, because there were no... If you do this, then this will happen to you. It was just, if you do that, well, you won't, will you? Because it's in the rules. But of course, bad things happened. And we're up to date still with most Finns. People from Finland oppose the Greek bailout, a poll says. 49% uh, of Finns said Finland should totally opt out of the rescue to Athens, the second Greek bailout just representative of European feeling. I'm not saying that all Finns are representative of all European feelings, I'm just saying that is representative of the Finnish feeling. Ekaterini gives us Greece red-faced after leaked debt warning. This is um, September the 2nd. The Greek finance ministry was on the defensive on Thursday after a new budget watchdog released an internal report warning that debt was out of control. Just as officials held critical talks with creditors, Finance Minister Evangelos Venizelos, who had enough troubles this week explaining Greece's reform delays, and target slippage to auditors from the EU, IMF and the ECB attributed the error to inexperience. All responsible international organisations know in which way macroeconomic and fiscal reports are compiled, checked and published, Venilos said in a statement. In other words, you've got to put it through me first and I've got to twist it all around so it sounds good. But it, the truth sneaked out. Uh, Greece is finance are spinning out of control. We knew they were out of control, but they're out of control with relation to what the IMF, ECB and EU said they should be at this time. This might sound all very boring and restating facts, but I'm trying to get somewhere. 
Europe alarmed as Italy's austerity plans unravel. Rome just a few weeks ago, Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi announced sweeping 45.5 billion euro package of austerity. Uh, down in the second paragraph, everyday modifications to a wide array of steps, whether tax increases, pension spending or cuts to local government, appear and vanish like so many trial balloons as Mr. Berlusconi struggles to appease the conflicted vested interests within his own faction, fractious coalition. Rounding out the fray are the centre, etc., etc. He's struggling, putting through the austerity measures. Understandable, but this is the second iteration of that. This is a very large sum of money. Uh, the situation is extremely serious, and there is no time to be rearranging the deck chairs, Mr. Callow said. Forget who he is, it's not important. Suggesting that ECB chief Jean-Claude Trichet may have to go to Rome and read the Riot Act. The government has agreed on tough measures to curb tax evasion, but wealth tax was dropped on the insistence of Berlusconi. The deal after three weeks of wrangling is so thin that the ECB may find it hard to justify further purchases of Italian debt. The bank, that's the ECB, has used intervention as a pressure tool to force states to deliver austerity. The point here is that, as I say, the politicians... Or off they've got a hotel room now they're they're not coming back and the ecb is left in charge of the children and doesn't want the job and doesn't really know how to do it so it's trying it with this number seven you can see the italian government tenure yield was getting horribly out of control uh heading up towards well it was, it was through six where it was heading we don't know the ECB then said, because it was left in charge, um, OK, we'll buy, the, um, we'll buy the Italian bonds and drive it down to five and hold it there until you lot get back from your bloody holidays. And then, with your EFSF, you politicians can take over all of these bonds and take it from there. Nothing to do with me. But... Berlusconi's been doing his typical Italian tricks, or that's the way it works down there. So you can see the um, kick up on the 10 uh, year Italian treasury with the ECB just letting it up, letting it up. So the ECB is putting pressure on the Italian government to push through these austerity measures. Now, this I'm pushing, there's so much going on in the background of so many other things, but just to stress that this is surely no way to run your club, that the central bank jacks up your interest rates to force your parliament into passing austerity measures while the politicians are on holiday. Just to stress, it, it's a cock-up of, of a mega proportion. So in the same article that the... Um, the one before the chart came up, it's from Evans Ambrose Pritchard again. Jans Weidemann, the bank's president, that's the Bundesbank, the German central bank, said monetary union risks losing its democratic legitimacy as EU leaders take a large step towards debt union without legal authority and sever the crucial link between budget policy and elected parliaments. He, I, it's good to shout that this is a problem, but it's not a problem now because that lot, they might be on holiday together, but they are not having a good time. They are not sorting it out. They are not forcing through any sort of union. And at this point, let's I'll, I'll throw myself right back. Right at the beginning, when they put these 3% uh, and 60% rules together, they did that because they were told by economists that the way they were doing this wouldn't work unless they had very, very, very strict rules that absolutely they would have to um, hold to because they knew that if it got out of control, the things that should have been there were not put in, the, in place. In other words, uh, the whole fiscal union thing. And without a fiscal union and the debts get out of control, the whole thing goes out of control. OK, so that wasn't there. I've forgotten what I was going to say, so I'll go on here. 
He said mass bond purchases by the European Central Bank had strained the existing framework. Okay, I know what I was going to say now. So, ten years went by with the with the EU in place and edging up through those limits and no sanctions being put on anybody. And they had developed a method of getting on and doing things with their treaties and their parliaments and their talking about this and that. Everything took an absolute age to do. So now, ten years later, when it is time to sort this thing out, they have got um, a way of doing things that it is terminally, let's just say, inefficient. It's, there are so many people in there and they have to have so much agreement and they've just got into a way of discussing these things that is just no way of, when you've got a real panic on, no way of sorting it out. So that's their main problem at the moment. They have had a problem that they should have sorted out 15 years ago, but now, 15 years later, they've got a way of working things that's incapable of work now working that problem out. Uh, Weidemann said that Weidemann said that if Europe is unwilling to accept a genuine fiscal union backed by a European tax system, it must strengthen the existing no bailout clause in the EU tre treaties in, instead of letting it be completely gutted. Um, that is the choice, but what do you do? The, the second thing isn't a choice anymore because um, strengthen the existing no bailout clause, it's been broken completely. Uh, Greece, Portugal, uh, Ireland have been um, bailed out, lent more money, and now Italy and Spain are having their government debt bought for them. So that's gone. So the other choice is the genuine fiscal union, which, as I've explained, by their way of um, now working their modus operandi, which is horrendously slow, will be impossible to implement before so much shit overwhelms them. So moving on to Germany, OK's Europe, Europe's latest rescue fund. This is uh, Angela Merkel. Ha her cabinet has said, yes, we will push for a vote on uh, jacking up the size of the EFSF bailout fund. So when we come back from our holidays, we'll be able to take over and work with that, as long as all 17 other members agree. It's got to go through all the parliaments. So let's have a look to see what an EFSF is. And this is, that's their logo up in the top left from their question and answer on the website. The European Financial Stability Facility is a company. That's the first thing to know. It's a sieve. It's a um, structured investment vehicle, which was agreed by the 16 countries that share the euro on May the 9th, 2010. There are 17 now and incorporated in Luxembourg. The EFSF's objective is to preserve the financial stability of Europe's monetary union, etc, etc. In order to reach its objective, the EFSF can, with the support of the German Debt Management Office, issue bonds or other debt instruments on the market to raise the funds needed to provide loans to countries in financial difficulties. Um, down at the bottom, uh, up to 440 billion on a pro rata basis, as they jacked into the ECB. So, it's a SIV, Special Investment Vehicle, offshore Luxembourg. It's, Luxembourg's not quite offshore, but it's the equivalent. And it's not taxpayers' money put into an account. It's uh, government guarantees, pro rata to the way they initially seeded the ECB, guarantees behind a bond. In other words, they, they say to the, the market um, and the EFSF have spoken to the uh, credit rating agencies and got a AAA rating for these bonds. They say, lend us money. And it's backed by the signatures of the 17 countries of the Eurozone. 
lend us money and we are going to do with that what we feel like doing. It's a AAA bond and you'll get this much interest. In other words, it, it's another credit card. So the, the, um, the EFSF then will have money and it can um, lend directly to governments, buy their bonds on the secondary market or buy banks. And this is what the people are saying if the shit hits the fan and it's just increasingly hitting the fan and the fan's clogging something chronic and going <laughs> now the general thing is that if you had one and a half trillion in there or two trillion you might be able to do some backing up but if the fund was that big then the actual guarantees from the countries backing it would be so substantial jacking up their debt to GDP ratios that the fund would probably lose its AAA rating because countries like France would have to then lose their AAA rating that was backing the fund. Now I've gone to these lengths of explaining these things just to show that it's horribly complex and horribly horrible. Disgustingly horrible. And let's finish with this. Number 11, PMI, manufacturing indices, standard store sort of stuff that I push out. What I'm, This is, everything would be alright if the world was booming and the economies were taking off again. But the, this, these, the you know, French down to Denmark, the, the PMIs, the, it, just because they're going down below 50 doesn't put Europe, Europe in a recession yet. It just means that things are heading in a bad direction. But things are heading not just in a bad direction economy-wise. The politicians and central bankers have absolutely no answers for the problems that are being thrown up. I see absolutely no out for them at all. There is no out for them at all. All they've got is hope that those PMIs will bounce off the 50 and start flourishing upwards again and there's growth of 4 or 5% in the Eurozone and everybody then breathes again because those debts can start being serviced again. But if those drop down and there is a recession in the Eurozone, the fan will stop and the Eurozone will break up and then who knows what will happen because so much is invested in it not stopping and the eurozone continuing and to imagine that the that won't affect the world of economics around the world into every small emerging market nook and cranny is moronic it will affect the world terribly the world will be shocked by it and i can see absolutely no way out of this not that i should be able to but I've found nobody that even thinks that they've got a, a, an idea to know how to get out of this, except hoping that it all turns out all right, and that ain't no sort of plan at all. So, if you got through to the end of this, well done, um, because this is gravely important stuff. Have a good rest of the weekend. Bye.